Hello and welcome to our WISPA America session. Today our topic will be great people, great company. My name is Abby Hubler with Minim. I will be the moderator of today's session. I am joined by Michelle Reese and Rob Campbell. I'll have them introduce themselves shortly. I am a customer success manager at Minim. I work with managing how we deal with our customers, um, communications, team building, and things like that, as well as a little bit of efficiency building with processes. I'm going to hand it over to Michelle to introduce herself. Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle Reese. I am the president of Internet of Things America. Um, I've been in the industry for two plus decades, um, been leading businesses and operations in the comp space for the past several years. Internet of Things America is an IoT solution provider that validates enabling technologies. So IoT software, IoT hardware, IoT networking. We do that end to end for service providers so that the service providers can provide IoT services to their customers with faster time to market and ease. So we design, we validate, we deliver, and we provide ongoing managed services of IoT for WISPs. Great, thank you, Michelle. And I'm gonna hand it off to Rob to introduce himself as well. Thanks, Abby. Hey, everybody, uh, Rob Campbell here, retired Army Colonel, did about 27 years, and then turned myself into a leadership author, speaker, and executive coach. I do leadership development for Cloudwise, been with them for about a year and a half. We've done some great things with that team and uh, look forward to sharing a bunch of those with you today. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. And I'll note for everybody at home, we have included our email addresses here on this slide. So feel free to contact us individually. If you have any questions about the presentation or the topics, we'd be more than happy to talk with you. So today in our session, we are going to zero in on three specific areas dealing with companies. The first is going to be superstar employees. Next, we'll jump into some employee growth. And then we will end it with talking about how do you build some teams. So I'm going to hand it off to Michelle to start us off with superstar employees. Sure. Thank you, Abby. So what I found is, is it's very difficult sometimes to find superstar employees, especially when you go to look at external candidates for uh, good, good employees. So typically in my experience, you know, as employers and myself, as I've tried to hire people uh, for positions and have really spent enormous amounts of time and money looking at external ca candidates, I don't always find a good fit um, in my teams and in my company. And I think a large part of that is because of the risk that's involved when you're bringing someone for a, a, as an external candidate into your organization. What I found and what most of the data that I've, I've found um, supports is that internal candidates are usually your best resource. Um, they're your hidden gems for developing into these superstar employees. And when I think of superstar employees, I think of employees that are a resounding good fit for the culture. They are utility players that often will um, fill in gaps beyond uh, their, their um, you know, day-to-day -day responsibilities to solve problems and really contribute value overall to the company, also to their communities. Um, and so they, they're really out there making um, contributions. So, from my standpoint, I think that the best place to, to look for um, developing out and building um, superstar employees is within your own companies. Um, when I think of kind of the recruiting process and how I typically go out and try to fill positions, if, especially if I'm looking for external candidates, I mean, you're sitting with HR, you're spending time, you know, doing uh, job analysis, you're spending time putting together job descriptions, you're trying to understand, you know, um, whether or not that, what, how that person should be paid um, and, and how it relates um, and fits in, into the, the organization. And then, you know, maybe you put an ad out, maybe you do a social media search and you start getting applicants for that position. And by that time, you, you're, you're weeding through applications and trying to understand, um, you know, through an interview process, 
who might actually uh, to be a good fit for the organization. And an interview process in general is fraught with a bunch of risk and a lot of uncertainty as well because so many of the interviewers are not trained um, in how to interview and how to screen for, for candidates properly. And a lot, uh, all interviewers will bring in a bias um, and they'll frame their questions and they'll frame their, their interpretation of candidate responses based on their own biases that we all have and we all bring with us. So it's, it's a very difficult process to get to know someone in a time frame um, where you can actually bring that candidate in and, and um, really have a, a, a good employee as a result of, of that process. So I know a lot of companies out there, especially in the communications industry, they've actually tried to use um, other types of, of organizations. So they um, have done outsourcing. There's a lot of companies like Randstad and Manpower and Adeco um, that will go out and try to source candidates as well because the hiring process has become so cumbersome. Um, those companies will then turn to use subcontractors in India and the Philippines and other places to try to source um, resources. A lot of times those subcontractors will scour, you know, LinkedIn and social profiles, really doing, um, you know, uh, the, the research to try to figure out, you know, who might be a good candidate for the type of position. And then they get incentives for, for trying to place positions within organizations. You know, this approach of trying to outsource um, the external candidate um, search really is unproven as well. I mean, both, both approaches um, haven't really um, been able to prove any, any um, um, effectiveness as it relates to, to selecting good candidates for positions. So I think the best place to look when it comes to um, superstar employees is those resources that are within your organization understanding um, who they are, how you can reskill those resources, and, and what gaps that you might need to develop within them to turn them into superstar employees and, and maybe even um, you know, leadership candidates uh, through the process. Okay, I'm coming in after you. Um, that's great stuff, Michelle. I, I, what I really liked um, what she said is about looking internally uh, when you're looking for that superstar employee, too often we look outside uh, the second we start thinking about hiring somebody. It's a great start point to look internal to your organization of those people that are there. And think beyond what they're doing now, think more in terms of their potential and whether they can grow into that position. In the Army, we put people into leadership positions often long before they had proven themselves, but we saw the potential and the uh, the hunger in them that, you know, uh, told us that we're going to be a future superstar employee. Who are they? Well, there, it's it's really my my pr um, approach to this is to focus uh, first on the company and what is the company's values, what does it stand for, what cause is it supporting, uh, and then you match the person to that because that's going to be really important. Like in Cloudwise, you know, a couple of our values are innovative and optimism and passion and respect. And so if somebody comes in and they don't subscribe to those values and we get a sense that they don't buy into those then it's not somebody we want um, so it really start with a company and, and why it exists and who are those uh best people that you want and it's not it's a constant assessment it just doesn't happen in the interview uh, or in the onboarding process um, you might have somebody that comes in and is, is a, a decent fit maybe not perfect but there's something there you can tell you know, this is a bit of a gamble. You don't, it's hard to know people through an interview process. Um, but you see something there, but you continue to assess that. Like in Cloudwise, you know, we, we want to measure people against optimism. Are they being optimistic? And we define what that looks like and then hold them to that because it's really important. We invested, you know, several weeks, several months actually, developing the values for Cloudwise. And uh, we hold our people to that. So I think that's where you get those superstar employees, the people that match, certainly looking internally for the, for the superstars within, but bringing people in that are uh, the best fit. When we interview on Cloudwise, we do it uh, very deliberately. It's a lengthy process, and a lot of people within the company talk to the new person, the potential hire. And the thing we're looking for is this phrase, yeah, he sounds like one of us, she sounds like one of us. Now you know you're onto something, and that's where you might have a superstar in your midst. How to attract them? 
Uh, I think it's about having a you know a healthy, positive work climate. Word gets out these days. It really does. You go to the Indeed sites and Glassdoor, and you see all of the assessments of companies. Word gets out. You can't hide that stuff inside of an organization. Uh, and so when you've got a place that's just a magical place to work, word's going to get out. I'm sure many of you know companies out there that are like that, that everybody wants to be a part. And that's, that's where you attract superstar employees by having a great, healthy climate. I always like to hire for character, train for skills. I do believe uh, that many people are capable of things far beyond what they think they might be. There's just a, a ton of capacity in each of us as human beings. What's really important is that character, uh, and those values that somebody describes, you know, subscribes to as they come in and how they present themselves. Those are really, really important things. And then lastly, um, you know, be very cautious of, of when you attract somebody, most people don't want to work in a job in a company. They want to serve a cause. They want to get behind something. And Cloudwise, in our vision statement, it's about empowering communities through technology solutions. That's a cause, right? What we do will help a mother homeschool a child in a remote area in North Carolina. That's a cause I can get behind. And we talk about that a lot in terms of attracting employees. We don't put a help wanted sign, uh, inquire within, uh, you know, sign on the door. You're not gonna attract that people that way. Get them behind a cause, like in the military. You know, you join the Marines, it's the few, the proud, or part of our team. That's the kind of stuff that attracts these kind of superstars. That was a lot of great information, guys. Thank you. Now let's move on to talking about engaging employees. Rob, how do you feel like we can best engage employees? Um, well, I think you know, first we got to talk about what that is because we, we hear this a lot. Um, and the Gallup uh, organization measures this constantly, which is really great. Uh, and right now it stands about 65% of employees that are disengaged from the company. So engaged employees, it's a psychological connection. Uh, if an employee is engaged, uh, they believe in what the company is doing. They're psychologically connected to the organization. They share the boss's passion to want to take the company to new heights. That's an engaged employee. That's, that's how you, you really define that and somebody that's plugged in. How do you do that? You can do surveys, uh, certainly appraisals and coaching and performance appraisals and things like that and interacting with employees talking about how they're doing and, and seeing kind of where they're motivated. Certainly there's a lot of performance measures that can come out of that, but <clears throat> that's what they are. Um, ways to engage is really uh, what I talk about in my book is meeting the desires of your people. Do they have these things? Fulfillment, autonomy. Um, do, is there praise and recognition? You know, is there an awards program, a recognition program in the company? <clears throat> safety means psychological safety not locked doors and fire extinguishers. Uh, it's more about, do they feel uh, comfortable to be critical and speak up about things, share their opinion, uh, contribute in many ways. Those organizations that are not safe because you've got toxic leaders and big egos that don't wanna hear things and kind of keep people down, or will be the places that you'll have disengaged employees. Uh, discipline and growth. You know, growth is, is a big thing too. Uh, organizations don't stand still, they grow, and so do people. I submit that each of the uh, people you have in your team is moving on some growth path. They want to be in a certain place. And you have to look at that from outside the walls of your organization. If an individual wants to be a CEO, well, the CEO is not going anywhere anytime soon. But that, that doesn't mean we don't grow them towards that end. That might mean they leave us at some point, and that's fine. They're gonna roll hard and do well while they're here, but we're growing them into some future professional level that they wanna be at. It starts with figuring out what that is. And it starts with a conversation with somebody to say, hey, where do you wanna be in life that gets you an engaged employee? And I'll add to that, it's far beyond the professional growth. It's also personal growth. What do they wanna be in their life personally? You know, Do they have a goal of learning a second language? Do they want to take a dream vacation with their husband or wife that they just never had a chance to do? Then those are personal goals. And, I, and if I was leading somebody, um, 
I'd want to know what those are, maybe challenge them a bit to stay on those goals and get fulfillment through those personal goals. I can't really hold them accountable to those, but I think it's important in terms of fostering um, engaged, engaged employees. Last point, and I'll hand it to Michelle. Um, why is this important? Uh, sports team, it's just like a sports team. I use that analogy quite a bit. Uh, are people on a sports team engaged? You better believe it. They're all in. They'll do anything. They'll sacrifice their own position, their own uh, goal or score, perhaps, for the betterment of the team so that the end goal is we win a championship. It's the same thing in a company. That's why it's important. That's why you want every employee engaged like you would have a teammate. And it results in you know great productivity, market share, and certainly business survival. Over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Rob. So one of the things that really resonated with me that you talked about was, um, you know, motivating around a cause. And I think that that is, is so important. It's important from the standpoint of company culture, but it's also important when you look about employee engagement. So I always um, approach it not from a one-to-one -one standpoint, like I am the manager, this is my employee. I really look at it uh, on, you know, how, you know, I would manage change as a leader in, in any kind of environment, right? So you're looking at um, engaging employees, but you're also looking at developing them at the same time. You're looking at, at um, you know, as Rob was saying, you know, helping them grow. That, that, that's exactly what you're trying to get accomplished, and that's called change, right? So, you know, I tend to fall back into, you know, some of the basic steps that I, I um, use um, when I'm trying to move the, the team through, through any type of change. So, you know, the first step for me is, you know, I want some urgency. I want some urgency around it. Um, you know, you as a leader, I try to create momentum. Uh, with the individual that I'm looking uh, for from um, an engagement standpoint with the team, but also with um, other uh, departments in the, the, the company with, um, you know, cross-functionally, you know, you've got to uh, kind of build that guiding coalition. So, you know, that's kind of my, uh, the, the second step I typically take, which is, you know, really kind of selling what it is I'm trying to get accomplished. You know, if it's, um, you know, an employee has expressed an interest in a certain area, you know, I go be their advocate across other divisions and say, this is what I'm looking for, for this employee to do. I, I want you to, you know, give me your thoughts on that. Let's, let's un, you know, put a communication plan. Let's kind of understand how we're, we can make this happen for that particular employee. And I think that that's important that you get buy-in across the organization. And then you really got to put together, you know, a vision um, for yourself, but also for the employee, a vision of how this looks. Um, it's really hard to tell the employee that they've got to have vision when you haven't empowered them or, or even shared with them kind of how you see it working out yourself. So I think, you know, having something that, you know, at least at a high level, I'm not talking about writing a dissertation here. I'm just saying, write down your mission, write down your purpose uh, together with the employee and talk about, you know, kind of what, what it is that you're looking um, for the future to be with with uh, with that employee, and then you know uh, with uh, with Rob with you being um, you know ex ex army you, you know you've got to enlist an army to make it happen right or or a village or whatever the analogy is. It's not just you that's going to make that employee into a superstar employee, and it's not just that employee. It takes others, and I think that that's um, you know something that I've I've learned you know um, it, being getting out there, advocating for the employee that you're looking to help to develop internally and to, to you know, um, put forward for opportunities for internal promotion. That, that's um, a very important step is to get um, others to also champion for that same cause. Um, you've also got to remove barriers. There will be barriers that come up um, in any organization. Anytime you're doing any kind of change, reskilling of, of employees or, or trying to um, you know, um, you know, motivate any anything positive. Um, you know, it, you've got to push a little bit out of that comfort zone, which means you're going to run into barriers. And so, as a leader, you know, it's really up up to you to really kind of enable action and remove those barriers from you know um, that um, employee's development. And then, you know, to to Rob's point, you know, I, I really like um, short term wins. So. You know, when it comes to to things, uh, Rob, when you mentioned, and and I completely agree with you on the praise and recognition. Um, for me, it's it's really you know, designing out and and kind of planning 
what some short-term wins are along this path. So it's not, you know, um, a, a, a product manager and a company that says, hey, eventually I want to be CTO someday. And, you know, it's it looks like it's, it's so far away from getting there, you know, helping and encouraging that individual that says, yeah, go get that dream. And here's some steps to do in the meantime and, and giving them the ability to kind of, um, um, you know, realize some, some wins and, and get some um, recognition and some praise will help to kind of um, uh, energize and also get that positive momentum that you need to really um, push for the, for employee engagement. And then, you know, anytime you've got any kind of um, acceleration or when the, Momentum starts to move, and and a lot of times, you know, in in the case uh, where I've been, is you know I get so excited because you know when you start to to you know just push forward in a positive way, oftentimes um, uh, you know the uh, the momentum will carry itself and things will accelerate very very quickly, sometimes more quickly than than you would have anticipated, and so you've really got to think about how do you ex sustain acceleration once that acceleration happens, right? So if you know, you start to see somebody that's really kind of pulling away and starting to have those, um, you know, short-term wins. How do you help them continue down that path and 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 um, and uh, continue to, um, you know, achieve the vision that 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 you've set and that they've set for themselves? Um, I think that that's important. And then making sure that you're, um, you know, instituting an an ongoing um, so so it becomes part of their lifestyle. It becomes part of their habits. It replaces, you know, maybe some of the comfort zones or the areas that that they have gravitated towards that you're trying to help them resolve, so that they can actually, um, you know, add greater value and, and demonstrate greater value to the business. Those are the types of things that I do um, when I'm looking at, you know, um, you know, managing new things within an organization to begin with. And I think it's important when you think about engaging employees. You know, you really got to always kind of look at it from the standpoint that you're you're essentially changing something, right? It, to get that engagement, you're essentially driving towards something. There's a mission there, and you've really got to kind of encapsulate that um, for the employees to get behind, and so that they can, um, you know, um, uh, be productive and add value to the business. That is a really good point, Michelle. I like that you you touched on having employees get committed to it. It's almost like they're signing on and they're saying, yep, I am on board to, to continue with this and continue my growth. So along those same lines, let's talk about employee growth in particular. So Michelle, how do you feel you can particularly encourage an employee to grow within the organization? Sure. So, you know, employee growth is tough because it's um, it's multifaceted and it, it's really as complex as the differences in each and every one of us. So it's not necessarily a one size fits all. There's not a a plan that, you know, you can um, hand to every employee and say, hey, welcome to the company. Here's your employee growth plan. It just doesn't work that way, right? So, um, you know, you really there, there is some nuance here and there's, um, you know, some some um, um, you know, intuition and some guidance that's needed from a leadership standpoint that that helps to kind of pull out um, from um, individual employees, you know, what what growth might look like for them. Now, collectively, we talk about it in our culture at IoT America. We talk about our, our growth mindset. We talk about what that means to each and every one of us. So we've created it within my company the ability to have that dialogue um, in a very open setting, um, you know, very safe setting where people can share their ideas on kind of what that, that looks like for them um, and, and, you know, not necessarily be um, uh, penalized for, for even having differences of opinions when it comes to, you know, the, the company's um, kind of mission statement and, and what, what it is that we're doing with a growth mindset culture. But um, that said, I still think, you know, there's some, some commonalities that occur when you're looking at employee growth. Um, again, I'm going to harp on that secure early wins. I can't harp on it enough because I'm telling you, when you, when you see an employee and, and you're giving them that incremental encouragement, but they're knocking down milestones that you've talked about together, that, that um, you know, and obviously those, those milestones, you, you need to help to connect that so that they understand 
how they contribute to the overall value of the business too. So it's not just you know um, an individualized milestone. It's it's a component of you know a, um, a an a priority of the business, right? But if you can if you can work it down to that level where you can show them how their contributions are making a difference for the company and for what we're doing, um, you know, from from the standpoint of, of of our business and how that what that growth means and what it means to the community, et cetera. That that's those that's huge when you're working with employees um, and engaging employees and getting growth out of employees. Um, I also think about it in in the sense of you know, in basketball, you know, when I played, um, our coach would always say, you got to go toward the ball. This, this is one of those situations where, you know, you really got to motivate the employee to come to you and, and kind of work through kind of what these, what these early wins need to be and, and really, um, uh, kind of build that momentum along. It's very difficult to even put quarterly bars up. I mean, everyone thinks quarterly is, you know, um, uh, a, a good metric. I would argue that it's got to be sometimes shorter time cycles. Sometimes, you know, something, you know, that's even monthly, but you've got to get them meaningful um, wins where they can feel like they're heading in the right direction. Even if those wins are self-paced or something that the employee has to design themselves from a learning perspective, um, recognizing it and making sure it's incorporated into their um, KPIs or their MBOs or whatever you're using to evaluate that employee is important. So, for example, I had an employee um, that, that works for me that wanted to go into management, um, but I didn't feel like he, um, you know, excelled on um, communication style and skill. So one of the things that I worked in with him is, um, you know, to participate in Toastmasters, and um, he ended up um, liking it so much that now he leads the Toastmasters group in our area. So, you know, it's just, it was that encouragement that says, hey, let's work on this right now. And I think it's important for you to have this and here are the reasons why it's important and why it would be meaningful when, you know, you go up for that promotion for manager. I think those are the types of things, that type of development that's important. And, you know, he felt like at every Toastmaster meeting, every time he got up was a win for him, was the way he described it to me. So that's, those are the types of things that I think is important across, you know, that you can apply for, for um, as you know, across other employees as well. It's, you know, making sure you're developing a plan that's got those early wins. Um, you also need to have something that um, can achieve um, alignment. So, you know, there's, there's all these um, root causes of poor performance that we're taught to identify um, from a leadership standpoint. I think that if you are architecting your organization in a way that's going to be positive and it's going to, you know, get that producti productivity and everything that um, that's needed, you've also got to be very, very good at identifying root causes of poor performance, but also root causes of performance gaps um, when it comes to leadership development. And so you've got to kind of figure out as well when it looks when you're looking at employee growth, how you're identifying those root causes of poor performance, and then how are you aligning the strategy, the structure, the systems, the skills, the culture of the organization to really kind of enhance and work out those um, uh, performance areas that are at risk to um, really kind of achieve alignment in the organization. So I think that that's an important. Um, piece too that I, I, I tend to apply and, and think about when I'm looking at employee growth. And then the last thing is a, really about the leader. You really have to manage yourself in this process. Everyone always talks about the employee and managing the employee growth, but so many times it's really about the manager, it's about the leader, and making sure that you know, you're putting the right metrics in place yourself um, to to ensure that you've got the right path for that particular employee and you're getting the right development for that employee's growth. And the one thing that I would um, um, put out there is build an advice network that's not within your organization. You know, build a network of people that you can call, that you respect as leaders. You know, some of them can be um, um, 
alive, but some of them could have been previous leaders, right? So, you know, um, you know, there's there could be um, leaders like George Washington and others that could motivate you in certain ways when it comes to um, how you hold yourself accountable. But but for the most part, built built an, a a group of of individuals of leaders that you respect that you can positively draw examples from and you know um, lean into those leaders whether you're reading about them in books or whether you're engaging um, is in my more extrovert fashion um, you know I like to engage more in a in um, a day to day kind of more communicative style so wh whatever it is whatever your style is from a leadership standpoint look for individuals that you can garner and get advice from to help manage yourself as you're helping these employees go through their growth process Okay, here I go. Um, that was great, Michelle. And I really like the, the, the part of, you know, celebrating the wins. Um, when somebody achieves a growth milestone, you know, too often we think of uh, celebrating wins and, and taking pause in our organization to celebrate success as something that's, you know, specific to performance measures and revenue growth, all important. But uh, when you celebrate a growth milestone in an individual, now you've just released the dopamine in them, which wants them, you know, it gets them thirsting for more success and wants to work even harder and become more engaged with your company. So really powerful. I love the fact that you brought that point up. Um, let me, let me uh, before I, I kind of walk through some of these points here, is why don't leaders grow their people? There's a few reasons. Uh, some of them, you know, the easiest ones are just egotistical. Or maybe they're afraid of being replaced, right? If I grow this person, he or she is going to take my job. Those are awful philosophies to use. Uh, the other might be that, you know, they just don't think that person has the ability to do what they need to do, to, to rise to that occasion. They're just not capable. And I got to tell you, I got a hard time with that one. I really do. I believe that people are capable of amazing things. Um, they have to want it themselves. The drive and the passion has to be there, but they can go to amazing places. There's a great book uh, by Liz Wiseman called Multipliers, and it talks a lot about um, multiplier leaders who multiply the capability inside their people to grow their people by pushing them sometimes into the deep end of the pool um, and watching them struggle, but learn and grow in that in that place. So I, that's why you know a lot of leaders just don't do it because they don't see the you know, the, the, the reason for it, uh, their ego is too big, or, you know, it might be they just went over a lot of time, but I submit to you that, that people are growing. And frankly, I see it as our duty as leaders. If I, if I were running an organization, uh, I would turn to my subordinate leaders and ask them how they are growing their people, what they are doing to grow their people. So uh, the first point is defining what it is. What is growth for somebody? And, you know, like Michelle mentioned earlier, sometimes it's hard to describe that, but I don't think that should stop us. Um, you know, just because you don't have a clear career path all the way up to maybe a CEO level, it doesn't mean you shouldn't grow somebody. You've got to think of it outside of the walls of your organization, like I mentioned earlier. In the Army, it was easy. I could see ahead 20 years of my career, and I knew where all the big milestones were. It's crystal clear. You can't do that in a business. You can't promise somebody in, you know, 15 years they're going to be the CEO. But there's some next step for them out there. So define what that is, even if it's only a small step to get them better, maybe better at what they do, or to take a step up in, into a leadership position or something, a place that they want to go, even if it means they have to leave you. Personal and professional growth, like I talked about, I believe we've got to strike a balance there. I would, I would want a leader uh, invested in me that was interested in my professional growth. Maybe I wanted to learn a second language, and I'd want a leader kind of pushing me along that because that would because that would bring me a lot of personal fulfillment on top of what I'm doing, you know, um, inside the organization. People are temporary. I submit that your company is a launching platform for the people that are in it. Too often leaders don't think this way because we're selfish. Oh, no, no, no. I've got Michelle in my company. I want to keep her forever because she's talented. She does things. I don't have to overwatch what she does. Uh, it just makes it easier for me. So why would I want to let her leave at some point in time? So we fight that. I submit we need to celebrate growth and celebrate the fact that Michelle might leave someday. 
because here's what's happening. If we're invested in her growth and we're seeing her in some future position beyond the walls of our organization, and I as a leader am committed to helping her grow and get to that place, she may not leave because she loves the fact that we're investing in her we're in, and she's an engaged employee in our team that she might stay. But if she does leave, then we've done her a good service and she will go off and do great things built off of what we did in terms of her growth. So you, you've got to think of people as temporary, you know, even from the start of um, when they show up, it's like, hey, Jim, I'm glad you're here. This is really great. We're, we're so proud to have you on the team. It's just wonderful. But I know you're not going to be here forever. So at some point in your journey, we need to talk about what your future looks like and you know, make a plan. There it is. So this is my second point is to make a plan. What's the path, right? Pretty linear. You can do it on a scratch piece of paper. You're here today. You need these two certifications. We know that, right? You got to go get your PMP or SHR and whatever that might be. So let's make that a milestone for you and then, you know, carve out the space for them to do it. And then what's the longer goal down the road? Look, look far beyond, get imaginative and, and you know, get, think big and put that out there. But you can work in the near term in terms of small steps they need to take to get there. Uh, and then the other part you've got with personal growth is you've got to support them in that. So let's say I've got an employee, Michelle and she really wants to be a dog trainer for some reason that's her passion right she's just passionate about uh, about dogs and loves to train them and she just wants to get certified to do that doesn't mean she's leaving the company because we pay her well and she does a great job and she likes it here it's got a great culture so here's what I would do as her leader okay great let's put you on a plan to get you dog trained certified and uh, I'll let you off early on Thursday so you can go to the community college and take the courses to get dog trainer certified and I'll pay for your books. You promise me you're going to stay on a glide path to get there. That can be an amazing thing for somebody. And that's how I would help somebody by helping them, you know, uh, supporting them in that growth path. If they need to get PMP, then give them the time to go do that. Don't just develop a growth plan and then go right back to your busy work and say, okay, here's your 12 tasks for the day. Make that part of the plan. And then, you know, balance personal, professional, like I, like I talk about. Uh, things that people want to do. It can be really, really powerful. So that's all I got to say about that. Those are a lot of great points. Um, Michelle, did you have something else that you wanted to add? Well, I just wanted to, to comment, uh, Rob, on your point when you were um, talking about um, make a plan and, and you talked about, um, you know, uh, balancing the professional and the personal and, and helping the, you know, dog trainer. Go. I think that is absolutely, you know, dead on. I think that that's exactly um, how leaders need to look at developing their people. It's not linear. People are people and they're so multifaceted. And I just think that that was a great point. Um, you know, I think too often um, leaders um, try to uh, look at, you know, what's the next skill set step or what's the next functional step for that employee. And this is actually why I think data science is going to be um, difficult to leverage uh, when it comes to, you know, putting together the right algorithms that's, you know, going to be able to um, determine best performers over all performers, et cetera, because it's very hard to do this in, in a linear way or um, in a transactional way. It's, it's, you've really got to really get engaged. And, you know, I would challenge any of the leaders listening to this that they really engage with their, their employees and, and really understand what, what is that, who is that person from a 360 view and not just from a professional view. I think it was a great point. Yes, I definitely agree. That was a really good point. So we've talked about, employees as individuals of how we can engage them and grow them and find them but we haven't talked about teams yet so rob why don't you give us some insight as to how we can build teams yeah you bet um it starts with it's, it's got to be grounded by vision values and culture you know what's the vision of the organization what are the values that we subscribe to and what what culture describes who we are uh and then getting the right people on that team right it's that important in the army, we had a set of values, you know, uh, loyalty, duty, selfless service. And people that could not be aligned with those values, that violated those values, we voted them off the island. 
Uh, and that's what you've got to do in a company. It has to be that important. So, and then, you know, a future vision of where your organization is in some future state, doing what it was meant to do, serving its cause to the best of its ability. And if you've got all of that as your foundation, you then can build a team building house on top of that. You've got to foster a very positive environment. And it's these questions you need to ask yourself. Belonging. Do, does everyone feel like they belong? You know, you can do surveys, you can poll your people, you can have, it, you know, informal discussions about, do you feel like you belong here, like you're a family member, like we, we rely on you and count on you? Um, do you feel that way? If you don't, then, then you're missing it. You're not going to be able to build that team. There has to be a shared future. We're all on this bus and we're, we're traveling up this hill. And if one of us gets off, we run the risk of not making it. You know, because every one of us is that important. We all share a future. In this future state, I can see us all there. You know, you've got to foster that. And then psychological safety, which I talked about earlier. I want to mention another great book, Daniel Coyle's Culture Code, uh, which is really good. It talks about a lot of these vulnerability and uh, belonging and a shared future where I get these things from. Really, really important in terms of the foundation. Next is you got to know your people. How do they fit in? They're not all wired the same. You know, some are introverts, extroverts, right? But they're all very valuable in their own different ways. And you can do some really neat analysis, the disk assessment and things, and it shows how teams are dysfunctional, but how you can bring them together and really you know, leverage the strengths of the others. Those are always fun things to do to kind of really get to know the individuals on your team. We, we get uh, teamwork through a hardship. You know, in the military, we form these really tight-knit squads and teams and platoons because we, we share hardship together. Uh, we do things together often. Now, you don't need, you necessarily meet, you, you don't make a platoon inside of a company, but you can do a lot of the same things by sharing some hardship together and some fun activities together by challenging each other, being open and honest. All these things are, are great things in terms of building teams and bringing them together. Got to have a plan, right? If you want to team build, then find team building events. You know, there's some fun things here we've done in Cloudwise uh, that have been really good, where you start to see people kind of break out of their shell a little bit, and you see them in a different light, not in their technical role or their marketing role or their finance role that you know them at, but you see them now as a real person. And it's a good forcing function and event for everyone to kind of come together and gel a bit doing something that's just completely different. Too often we're afraid to have team building events and aren't particularly related to what we do as a company. I think that's exactly what you need to do. Go do something that's just completely unrelated to what you do as a company. Maybe it's a thought provoking video or a TED talk that everybody watches over a lunch and then you all talk about it. And you start to see, hear different opinions and, and, and understand people a little bit better. It could all be really powerful things towards team building. And then again, a recognition program like Michelle talks about, celebrating the wins, stopping and pausing to celebrate those things and challenging people to be the next person to get the trophy. All those are really um, healthy and fun things to do um, in team building. I want to speak to the time that we're in right now in this, uh, in this coronavirus period that when we're all separated, right? It's a whole new leadership dynamic that, you know, we could probably spend another hour talking about. But in Cloudwise, we're getting ready to have a quarterly offsite. It's always been the plan in early April to talk about Q1 and then look forward to Q2. Uh, and we've always come together to do a quick team building event and then get into the weeds of what we're doing in the business, get everyone the bigger picture and do a lot of different things. Well, we're having to do that virtually now through, I think, Slack or maybe Zoom or well, some medium that way. But we're still doing a team building event. So what we're doing is we're going to do MTV Cribs. And so everybody, every employee gets one minute to film where they work at home and just do like a quick walkthrough of their house. You have to go in the fridge to show us what's in the fridge and some other fun things like that. But isn't that a really neat thing to you know, for people to share with their spaces and what they're doing and for us to kind of get to know each other and, and to have some fun at the same time. So you don't necessarily have to be all in the same building, but you can do things virtually in terms of team building. That can be a ton of fun. So there's a lot here. I'm eager to hear what Michelle's got to say about this too, because it's a really important topic. No, I, I, I love the, the creativity, Rob, especially during this time. It's, it's difficult when you know, you've got to practice the social distancing. So I, I think the, the, those are 
some good good thoughts there. Um, you know, from a team building perspective, um, what I typically um, coach, and, and oftentimes I find myself coaching and advising um, individuals in my network or, um, you know, um, you know, managers that I have that, that work for me that manage um, others, um, when they're, they tend to come to me when there's challenges. Um, and so, so, you know, kind of when I looked at this, I was thinking that maybe somebody's um, wanting to understand, you know, about team building because they themselves are, are experiencing some of these same challenges. And so I thought that I would, you know, you know, talk through experientially a few of these and, and see if uh, if that can can help others. Um, I think Rob, I think you definitely covered it. One of the things that um, um, I've seen, especially in, in newer uh, managers, is they often try to do these team building activities and events before they've actually put um, the core in place. So making sure that you do have this, these vision, values, and culture, I think it's important to have, you know, kind of the core of what the team is before you try to start doing the team building. So, you know, sometimes, um, you know, if you put the cart before the horse, it, it, it can cause some, some challenges. So um, oftentimes I see that where, you know, managers um, try immediately to go into the fun and they forget that they've got to do a little bit of work to get there. Um, another challenge that I've seen um, uh, leaders uh, come into is that they, they tend to try to do it all themselves, right? So, um, you know, and I don't know if it's ego or, or sometimes it's just fear of uncertainty. And, you know, I think um, oftentimes, you know, sometimes we revert back to our middle school or our high school selves when it comes to, you know, being in groups of others. But, um, you know, sometimes in business, I've seen leaders just try to take it all on. Like, I am going to build this team. <laughs> You forget that there's other participants on the team um, and, um, you know, that they themselves actually have to get on the team, that they're part of the team. That's, that's another challenge that, you know, when you look at it like you've got to do it all yourself, you know, you kind of, um, you know, undo the whole dynamics and the power of what, what a team actually is. And so um, oftentimes, you know, again, it's kind of when I was saying early, manage yourself. A, a lot of the challenges that, that I tend to see in leaders and managers is within the leader and, and manager themselves. And so, you know, really kind of doing some reflection and understanding what it is that you want the team um, to do uh, well at, um, you know, focus on the business, et cetera. And then how do you work in the other nuances around that, you know, that kind of stated desire um, that you're trying to do? Um, yeah, and then the other thing is, is um, from a team building perspective that I think is, is important that you are constantly doing the um, continual assessment of the team. You know, oftentimes one of the, um, and this happens a lot in the corporate environments that I've had exposure in, there, there are team members that have been on the team too long. It's time for that team member to go try something else. It's time for that team member to go, um, you know, explore other avenues in, in that particular team member's development uh, within the organization. And if you're just focused on your team and you're just focused on your business goals and you've got a singular kind of narrow focus, you're really not going to see, one, that that, that individual probably may be very good at that one skill set but may be toxic to the team. And you're not going to be able to help that individual kind of explore other areas that might be more fulfilling outside of your team, maybe onto, you know, your peers team or someone else's team, right? So, um, you know, you really got to kind of have a broad view when it comes to team building uh, within your organization. And you really got to think about the dynamics of the group as a whole and not necessarily just what's within your domain of responsibility, per se, more about, you know, kind of what does it look like? you know, um, and, and how do the players coexist across the entirety of the organization? So I think that, you know, um, making sure that you've got that organizational alignment, um, you know, that you, you know, understand kind of where um, your employees and, and your team kind of fits within your organization and where others might be better served doing service on other teams. Um, you know, I think that those are kind of important areas to do some continual assessment on when you're looking at, um, you know, some of the, the, the challenges that building a positive and constructive team and, and really kind of going after the things that, that you're hoping for the team to accomplish. So those are the only things that I would add um, to what you said, Rob. I think, um, you know, you, you really framed it in a great way. 
Thank you both for, for so much great information. So since we've had to change the way that we do this session with the current situation with COVID-19, I'm going to be the one asking some questions instead of opening it up to the audience. So I have some questions based off the information that we've already gone over, and I will open them to both you and you, Michelle, and Rob to answer. So feel free to, to jump in, whoever would like to, to touch on it or both. So first off, you know, building a culture that has growth and engagement can be difficult if you say came into a new company you're now a manager and that hasn't always been there so do you have any advice for people who say are new to a a company or they want to start invoking this sense of growth and engagement of where they can start or perhaps how they can start building it within a smaller team and then expanding it outward Sure. Let me uh, let me hit take the first whack at that. Since Michelle finished last, we'll just keep flip flopping. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there's a couple things like you know leaders uh, at, at at numerous levels, whether they're leading two people or two thousand, uh, own certain things that that mean meaning nobody can take those away from them. And for me, it's investing in people. For it's the stuff we're talking about here today. Uh, there's not much in the way in most cases in a company that's going to get in the way of you sitting down and coaching your person or a person or developing a growth plan or things like that. So you have to look at it in terms of, um, I own that and I, and I can do that inside of my team. Now, when it comes to, uh, trying to, uh, sell a, um, a program or an idea to the bigger organization, to a boss, uh, get a sense for where, certainly where the organization is. So you, know, you want to show alignment in everything, every idea that you have. You want to be able to trace that alignment to, hey, listen, I've got a great team building idea for this organization that I used in my last company, and it's perfectly aligned with our vision, values, and culture. You're on solid ground if that's your start point. And then latch on to those things that are important to your boss, the one that's going to be able to make the decision. I say a lot of times, use their words back against them. Sounds devious, doesn't it? But it really isn't. It's more about showing alignment. You know, if they're really focused on people, you know, they're a people-centric leader, you know, but they're just not doing much teamwork, then okay. You, again, you're on solid ground. Hey, boss, I know you're a very people-centric leader, and I appreciate that. And I've got uh, these two great ideas for a team-building event that can um, accomplish those things that you talked about that you talk about often in our you know weekly meetings and here's what they are and here's how we can do them and here's what it would cost and you know, i am ready to, to put these into practice if you'd like so it's really understanding the bigger picture uh seeing where where your you know the mindset of your boss is sometimes there's a challenge there but you can be a bit devious uh in terms of finding those things that your boss is talking about you know i'm just really focused on increasing productivity for uh, quarter number two, right? I just want to get us to our financial goals. Okay, team building is a way to get there, but you got to be, this is where you got to invest some time and to think, okay, how do I present this to him focused on him or her uh, and their objectives and where they want to get to revenues? How can I trace that back to team building and how that's going to, you know, allow us to get there? And if you can do that, then you've got some magic to go forward and um, and achieve success. That's a great question, Abby. Thank you. I appreciate your answer on that. I agree. It it helps to go to to the head honcho and to kind of say what you'd like to have happen in the words that they understand. And I've I've done that from experience, and usually it helps. Um, sometimes you don't get it at the the first time you go and you approach the head honcho, but sometimes as time goes on and you show that value, that usually helps. So we've talked a lot about employees in general, but what I'm curious about, and, and I'll start with you, Michelle, to, to see your thoughts on this. How do you engage the different levels of employees? So you've got the leadership team, you've got managers, you've got frontline employees. How do you make sure that you engage them as individuals, and do you employ any different kinds of methods per employment type? Well, so um, I do it both in a structured and unstructured way today. And, um, you know, essentially for me, it's more about, um, you know, just understanding, getting situational awareness 
it's not about um, trying to you know um, find out if somebody's not performing correctly or if there's you know um, you know gaps or, or issues it's really more about kind of understanding what situation the people that work with me are up against right so um, but I, I, I definitely do you know um, you know structured engagements with my direct line. I also do structured engagements with skip levels. So, I mean, I definitely um, have a formal process in place uh, where I make sure that there is an, um, a communication path that's available uh, to talk about things that might be impacting the performance of the business or, you know, things that, that we might um, uh, need to, to focus on um, that would be opportunities for the business. So I think that from a communication standpoint, um, it is important to have, you know, open and, and honest dialogue. Um, again, you know, I, it, if you do this and you punish people, um, you can a actually have um, the opposite effect. So I think it's important that if you take this approach, you take it, again, with, this, with the approach of a growth mindset, uh, where we're all in this together, we're all improving, we're all building together. Um, I think that um, if, you, if you have the right approach and, and you're, um, looking for the information um, for the right reasons, um, it tends to be a very powerful to have um, communications uh, across the, the, the different groups and, and the different levels within the company. You still have to respect organizational structure. So you don't want to, um, you know, make decisions that your direct line's not aware of, right? So I think that you know, there is, um, you know, obviously still, still some sensitivities and, and things that are involved, uh, which is why having that structured communication where you've got, you know, a, a, a good solid cadence going, um, it usually prevents, you know, any of those kind of mishaps that would, um, you know, um, not necessarily allow for, for your leadership team to shine. You know, the one thing I did want to say on the last question, too, um, that, that came to me, Rob, when you were, were giving your answer to, um, you know, it's important when you're inheriting a team that you don't criticize the previous leadership. There may be past performance challenges, and there's a reason why that leadership is still not in place. But when you're working to build teams, if you're inheriting a team, that is one one important lesson that I think um, you know um, leaders um, sometimes can can falter on that can actually um, haunt them as they, um, you know, push forward and, and try to take the helm of, of that, that team um, themselves is, is by criticizing um, past leadership. So that's, that's one thing that I just thought would be a good point to make is, is when you're inheriting a team, you really got to think about, you know, what, uh, what the mechanics of the business is, what the go forward is, what the mission, the value, et cetera, you know, um, echoing some of uh, your points there, Rob, and then what that what that looks like in the future and not look in the past and not worry about the ghosts of leadership's past. So. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, Michelle. It's an excellent point. Look through the windshield, not the rear view mirror. It's very dangerous when you start talking badly about those who came before you. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. You have to be careful about that. So I, I wanted to thank you both for joining me on this conversation. We've gone over a lot of great information, and I recommend that the listeners contact Michelle, Rob, or even myself if you have any other questions. Our emails are listed on that slide that listed our names, so feel free. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions or network with you. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to listen to our session. And as you have heard, a great company comes from great people. So again, thank you, Michelle and Rob, for joining me. I appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks, Abby. Great, thank you. Thank you.